NCCR Welding Basics 34108-10 Boilermaker Level 1 3.0 Welding Safety. Um, this will cover par or I don't know. Uh, out of this module, it'll cover Section 3.0 Welding Safety. My name is Gary Pace. I'm a PE CWI, May 2019. This is just going to shadow the material that's in there. Um, the material isn't exactly what you would find in Boilermaker Level 1, um, but I, I went to other sources and put together kind of a shadow um, presentation. So if you're looking to, um, if you want something to cover the material and you went to a class and maybe you needed a refresher or wanted a different angle on what's been covered, um, that's what I'm doing here. As a boiler maker, you're going to run across welding. You might not be the person that's doing the welding, but there's going to be a lot of welding that you're around. So you need to understand, you know, some of the inherent risks involved in welding and then some of the, uh, you know, actions you can take and equipment you can wear to mitigate those risks and those um, factors that, you know, would cause you harm so we're going to talk about welding safety there you you can go on about welding safety for hours and hours we're just going to get a quick overview that's going to shadow what's in um, the nccr boilermaker level one under welding basics ppe 3.1 personal protective equipment well the reason we're looking at ppe is there's a number of different hazards that welders can encounter. Um, electric shock, fumes and gases, fire and explosion, heat, noise, injuries from insufficient PP, and other safety considerations. So one of the biggies for welding is, you know, radiant heat. And, you know, the arc is going to kick off ultraviolet um, radiation. So those are two biggies and reasons why that we wear heavy clothing in welding and we have the full face mask for welding helmets. It's not that you couldn't just get a pair of goggles, a little pair of goggles and have a really tinted, um, have the right shade of lens in there, but the rest of your face would get burnt to a crisp. I had a guy 20 years ago do this, different story, different time, but he put a number 12 welding lens in one of those cutting goggles and then he went and arc welded and it just sunburned him really bad um so we've got a lot here you can see just a smattering of the ppe that's a, available to welders you know they wear this leather because not because it's fashionable but because it's heavy it absorbs um ultraviolet radiation it absorbs heat they don't get burned you look at the gloves, they look like oven mitts, depending on which kind of welding you're using, um, how much thermal energy is involved. So you got hot pieces of metal, you got sharp pieces of metal, pointed pieces of metal. There's all kinds of different reasons why you get all um, dressed up and put on this type of heavy clothing to weld. And PPE is ultra important in welding. Eye and face protection. Um, the document that covers eye and face protection is ANSI Publication Z87.1, Practice for op Occupational and Educational Eye and Face Protection, Latest Edition. Scope. This standard sets forth criteria related to description, general requirements, testing, marking, selection, care, and use of protectors to minimize or prevent injuries from such hazards as impact, non-ionizing radiation and chemical type injuries in occupational and educational environments including but not limited to machinery operations, material welding and cutting, chemical handling and assembly operations. So this document Z70, Z87.1 is it, it covers you know eye protection and face protection which are very important things you know you don't want to come home with a chunk of iron stuck in your face or missing an eye you know that we these are things in the that we in the first world you know u.s canada and western europe take for granted but these are very important things eye protection you know you can't just 
cut the bottoms off a couple of Coke bottles and throw them in a leather strap and call it safety glasses. I mean, that's probably better than nothing if you're working somewhere in the developing world. But here in the U.S. and in Canada, this is a very important thing. So we need to be cognizant that this document exists, and it is the governing document for eye and face protection. Here are some pretty standard examples of uh, eye, ear, face, and head protection. Um, pretty pretty uh, self-explanatory. Everybody knows what all this stuff is. Um, but it's very important uh, part of our toolkit. You don't want to be somewhere watching somebody weld and not have the right shade of lens or not have safety glasses on when somebody's grinding or not have hearing protection or in place when you know there's excessive noise levels so radiant energy electromagnetic energy given off by an arc or flame can injure workers eyes and is commonly referred to as radiant energy or light radiation for protection from radiant energy workers must use personal protective equipment such as safety glasses goggles welding helmets or welding face shields this equipment must have filter lenses with a shade number that provides the appropriate level of protection. A shade number indicates the intensity of light radiation that is allowed to pass through a filter lens to one's eye. Therefore, the higher the shade number, the darker the filter, and the less light radiation that will pass through the lens. Electric arcs, as well as gas flames, produce ultraviolet and infrared rays which have a harmful effect on the eyes and skin upon continued or repeated exposure. The usual effect of ultraviolet radiation is to sunburn the surface of the eye, which is painful and disabling but generally temporary. Ultraviolet radiation may also produce the same effects on the skin as severe sunburn. Exposure of the skin and eyes to the arc is the same as exposure to the sun. Anybody that's ever had a good flash burn on their eyes or welded, done something stupid like welding without long sleeve shirt on knows what a sunburn is. Especially it's a really fun one, and I'm being facetious here, sarcastic. A really wonderful thing is when you TIG weld with just gloves on and you are an idiot and don't wear the long sleeve shirt and you get sunburned on the bottom of your arms a part of your arm that never sees any exposure to the sun, that, it, that's a burn that really hurts. So um, that's why we're talking about safety and, you know, wearing protective clothing and PPE is to um, not have that happen to somebody. Radiant energy continued. The production of ultraviolet radiation doubles when gas-shielded arc welding is performed. Infrared radiation has the effect of heating the tissue with which it comes in contact. Therefore, if the heat is not sufficient to cause an ordinary thermal burn, the exposure is minimal. Leather and wool clothing is preferable to cotton clothing during gas shielded arc welding. Cotton clothing disintegrates in a day or couple weeks, presumably because of the high ultraviolet radiation from the arc welding and cutting. So leather, leather and wool are your preferred um, materials of clothing when um, welding and there's a reason that uh, welding supply places sell a lot of leather it's not due to be in a fashion statement although it does look cool um, but leather takes a beating a lot better than cotton so does wool don't wear synthetics don't wear polyesters or something that's made of an oil or um, a petroleum product that's not a good thing those things are very flammable here we have a sample of a filter lens protection for shielded metal arc welding. You can see the electrode size and then the amps and then the OSHA minimum protective shade number and then you can see the ANSI AWS shade number. So um, the OSHA minimum for let's say a 332 to 532 electrode is an 8 ANSI and AWS says the minimum you should use is a 10. So whatever the OSHA minimum is, ANSI and AWS, their recommendation is a couple higher. So um, just be cognizant that if you have questions about whether or not you or somebody you know is using the 
proper protection um, as far as a filter lens for uh, different types of arc welding. There's a there's charts out there produced by OSHA and ANSI that will give you the proper number of the protective shade that you need to use for arc welding operations. Here's an individual that's outfitted and ready to go to weld, personal protective equipment, sturdy boots, clean clothing, wool is best, treated cotton is acceptable, no synthetics, pants without cuffs. The reason you don't want cuffs on your pants is because something will catch in there and catch them on fire. Um, pants outside the boot because if a spark lands on your pants, you don't want it rolling inside, rolling the burning material or liquid metal into the inside of your boot. You want flaps on your shirt pockets, cap, gloves, and leathers. Personal protective equipment. General, the electric arc is a very powerful source of light, including visible ultraviolet and infrared radiation. Protective clothing and equipment must be worn during all welding operations. During all oxyacetylene welding and cutting processes, operators must use safety goggles to protect the eyes from heat, glare, and flying fragments of hot metals. During all electric welding processes, operators must use safety goggles and a hand shield or a helmet equipped with a suitable filter glass to protect against the intense ultraviolet radiation and infrared rays. When others are in the vicinity of the arc welding processes, the area must be screened so that the electric arc cannot be seen either directly or by reflection from glass or metal. Here's a, we've looked at this slide before, but I'm just going to throw this in and kind of tell a little story here too. Hopefully it doesn't get too long-winded. Um, years ago, I was training a guy to try and weld. We needed welders. He was a forklift operator, had welded in college, blah, 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 or welded in high school, I guess. Had some, and I thought, oh, he might make it. So anyways, I give him a, a welding hood and some leathers, and I'm like, you know you can practice here's the mig welding machines if you use this area you can practice after work see if we can get you to pass a test plate well i come into work on monday morning maybe it's a tuesday whatever day of the week and one of the welders is like you gots to see your boy go take a look at your boy you gots to see your boy so i go and look at go to talk to him this guy that's welding was trying to pass the weld test or you know practicing to get so he could take the test and instead of using the full face shield the hood he had taken the lens out of the the arc welding hood the face shield the full face shield and put it in a set of cutting goggles like the ones on the right here the little red ones so the lens will fit in there he put the lens in there it didn't affect his eyes but he was welding and he looked like a raccoon. His, uh, his face was just burnt to a crisp. It looked like he had laid on the beach, in Miami, the beach in Miami, Florida for a week straight and just gotten cooked. His face was cooked and blistered. And I'm like, dude, why did you do that? And he's like, he tells me, oh, the, the face shield was too heavy. I couldn't, it just bugged me. And I'm like, dude, do you think there's a reason every other welder on the planet, maybe not planet, every other welder that does arc welding in the United States wears this one and they don't put a really dark lens and a pair of cutting goggles? It's because the radiation will cook your skin. It, you don't want to be doing this. Well, anyways, that's my rant on um, ear, eye, face, and head protection. But a little anecdote there for you that just when you think you've seen it all, somebody does something that's so far beyond what you had expectations of stupidity to be. So, but anyways, even though those dark lenses will fit in a pair of cutting oxy of fuel cutting goggles, don't put them in there for arc welding. Those are uh, there's a reason that people wear the full face shield. Welding arcs are intensely brilliant lights. They contain a proportion of ultraviolet light which may cause eye damage. For this reason, the arc should never be viewed with the naked eye within a distance of 50 feet, 15.2 meters. 
The brilliance and exact spectrum, and therefore the danger of the light, depends on the welding process. The metals in the arc, the arc atmosphere, the arc length, and the welding current. Basically, don't look at the arc unless you've got a, the appropriate eye protection in place, which is a shaded lens, and you need to look and see that you've got the, the proper lens for the proper job, for the type of arc welding and amperage and um, voltage that you're utilizing. Helmets and shields continued. Operators and fitters and those working nearby need protection against arc radiation. The intensity of the light of the arc increases with the increasing current and arc voltage. Arc radiation, like all light radiation, decreases with the square of the distance. Those processes that produce smoke surrounding the arc have a less bright arc since the smoke acts as a filter. The spectrum of the welding arc is similar to that of the sun. Exposure of the skin and eyes to the arc is the same as exposure to the sun. Noise levels. Um, the documents that control noise levels are General Industry Standards OSHA 29 CFR 1910.95, Safety and Health Regulations for Construction 1926.52, Occupational Safety and Noise Exposure. Noise or unwanted sound is one of the most pervasive occupational health problems. It is a byproduct of many industrial processes. Sound consists of pressure changes in a medium, usually air, caused by vibration or turbulence. <clears throat> These pressure changes produce waves emanating away from the turbulent or vibrating source. Exposure to high levels of noise causes hearing loss or may cause other harmful health effects as well. The extent of the damage depends primarily on the intensity of the noise and the duration of the exposure. Noise-induced hearing loss can be temporary or permanent. Temporary hearing loss results from short-term exposure to noise with normal hearing returning after a period of rest. Generally, prolonged exposure to high noise levels over a period of time gradually causes permanent damage. OSHA's Hearing Conservation Program is designed to protect workers with significant occupational noise exposures from hearing impairment even if they are subject to noise exposures over their entire working lifetimes. Here you can see different noise levels, um, typical weighted sound levels. Threshold of hearing is zero decibels um, at a thousand hertz. North rim of the Grand Canyon is 20. Soft whisper is at two meters is about 35 decibels. 50 decibels is an urban residence. Vacuum cleaner at three meters is about 70 some. Heavy truck at 15 meters is at 80. Jackhammer at 15 meters is 90 decibels. 110 meters at uh, 110 decibels is a discotheque. 125 is a jet takeoff at 100 meters, and 140 is the threshold of pain. So when people start throwing out decibels and sound levels, this is some, gives you an idea of what some of the, what some of the decibel numbers are attached to a typical sound. As an inspector, some, here's some of the sounds you may come across um, that are potential hazards. Some operations in welding and materials joining produce excessive noise, which may lead to hearing loss. Abrasive blasting, 105 to 112 decibels. Needle gunning, 113 decibels. Scaling, grinding is 108 to 110 decibels. Carbon arc gouging, 102 to 118 decibels. Pneumatic pumps, 100 decibels. High pressure steam cleaning, ventilation equipment, plasma arc cutting, engine driven generators, high frequency and induction welding power sources. So there's any number of things that can um, contribute to um, noise pollution or noise be a noise source that can be a potential hazard. So just be um, cognizant that there's a lot of things that produce noise and um, don't be afraid to ask questions or wear hearing protection. And Generally, it's a good idea to wear hearing protection, and a lot of places it's required.
depending on what the the noise level is. Ventilation while welding has become more important over the last, I don't know, three decades. I think back in the old days, it was just part of the, you know, the, the job. Okay, you show up, you breathe some smoke, you have some um, black boogers, and uh, that's how life was. And then they figured out, oh, it's not uh, not so safe or not good long-term health-wise for um, people to be breathing all this um, smoke. You know, especially when they started finding out some of the metals that were in the welding smoke, you know, nickel and um, chromium and a lot of these other metals that, you know, not good for human beings to be breathing in. So um, ventilation is extremely important for welders. There's, you know, a couple of different options you can go. You can have, uh, you know, the a gun suck it out, suck the, uh, remove the fumes from the weld area. You can have a portable exhaust hood. There's a couple of different methods for removal of the welding plume from the work area. What is in a welding fume? Well, first you got some metals. Aluminum, antimony, arsenic, beryllium, cadmium, chromium, cobalt, copper, iron, lead, manganese, molybdenum, nickel, tin, silver, titanium, vanadium, zinc. You've also got gases. You've got the shielding gases, which are argon, helium, nitrogen, carbon dioxide. You can also have nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, ozone, phosgene, hydrogen fluoride, and carbon dioxide. There's a lot of stuff on that list that you really do not want to be breathing in. You do not want it in your lungs, and you do not want it entering into your system. So that's why we're trying to get rid of welding fumes or not breathe them. But we're just setting the table here on what's in a welding fume. Okay, I borrowed most of this information from uh, OSHA fact sheet, DSG FS 3647-03-2013, Controlling Hazardous Fume and Gases During Welding. Pretty good sheet, a lot of information on it, and I thought, man, eh, they know more than I do. They're the guys that are writing it. So here we go. We're going to delve into it. I'm just giving them credit for what I'm borrowing from them. Welding joins materials together by melting a metal work piece along with filler metal to form a strong joint. The welding process produces visible smoke that contains harmful metal fumes and gas byproducts. Health effects of breathing welding fumes. Acute exposure to welding fume and gases can result in eye, nose, and throat irritation, dizziness, and nausea. Workers in the area who experience these symptoms should leave the area immediately and seek fresh air and obtain medical attention. Prolonged exposure to welding fume may cause lung damage and various types of cancer including lung, larynx, and urinary tract. Health effects of certain fumes may include me metal fume fever, stomach ulcers, kidney damage, nervous system damage. Prolonged exposure to manganese fume can cause Parkinson's-like symptoms. Gases such as helium, argon, and carbon dioxide displace oxygen in the air and can lead to suffocation, particularly when welding in confined or enclosed spaces. Carbon monoxide gas can form, posing serious asphyxiation hazard. Fumes and gases are generally a greater concern in arc welding than oxy-fuel gas welding, cutting, or brazing. Arc welding can generate a larger volume of fume and gas due to the variety of materials that can be involved. Protection from excess exposure can generally be done with ventilation. When exposure will be exceeded, permissible limits with available ventilation satisfactory respiratory protection shall be used. Protection must be provided for welding, cutting, and other personnel in the area. Here's a list of some OSHA standards applicable to welding. Um, I'm not going to read through this whole list, but they're all listed there. Um, I pulled this off an OSHA sheet. So if you really want to delve into the, the, the nitty gritty of welding fumes and the other uh, occupational hazards involved with welding, here are the documents that cover those subject matter. Arc welding types in order of decreasing fume production. Um, not arc, all arc welding is the same in regards to fume production. 
Flux cord arc welding is a much dirtier process in regards to producing fumes and gases just due to the nature of the process, which we'll touch base on later. Um, shielded metal arc welding is number two. Gas metal arc welding is uh, number three. And then gas tungsten arc welding, TIG, is um, the cleaner of them. But there's no flux being burned. There's nothing being kicked off there from the arc. So, of course, TIG or gas tungsten arc welding is going to be a much cleaner process. And if you've ever been in any welding shops, depending on what process they're using, I'll tell you what the air quality is going to be. So um, just keep this in mind. Exposure factors. Welding rod composition, position of the head, type of ventilation, the work area, background fume level, design of welding helmet, base metal and surface condition, and air movement. These are all variables that come into play when figuring out exposure factors and how much um, of these uh, chemicals or metals an individual has been exposed to. So these are all things that we need to be cognizant of in regards to welding fumes and generation of welding fumes. And when you're inspecting welds, you need to be cognizant of these things because you're breathing the same air that the welders are. Just because you're an inspector doesn't mean you're immune to any of these things. Reducing exposure to welding fumes. Welders should understand the hazards of the materials they are working with. OSHA's hazard communication standard requires employers to provide information and training for workers on hazardous materials in the workplace. Welding surfaces should be cleaned of any coating that could potentially create toxic exposure such as solvent, residue, and paint. Workers should position themselves to avoid breathing welding fumes and gases. For example, workers should stay upwind when welding in open or outdoor environments. General ventilation. The natural or forced movement of fresh air can reduce fume and gas levels in work area. Welding outdoors or in open workspaces does not guarantee adequate ventilation. In work areas without ventilation and exhaust systems, the welder should use natural drafts along with proper positioning to keep fume and gases away from themselves and other workers. Local exhaust ventilation systems can be used to remove fume and gases from the welder's breathing zone. Keep fume hoods, fume extractor guns, and vacuum nozzles close to the plume source to remove the maximum amount of fumes and gases. Portable or flexible exhaust systems can be positioned so that the fumes and gases are drawn away from the welder. Keep exhaust ports away from other workers. Consider substituting a lower fume generating or less toxic welding type or consumable. Do not weld in confined spaces without ventilation. Refer to applicable OSHA regulations. Respiratory protection may be required if work practices and ventilation do not reduce exposures to safe levels. Here's a pic couple of pictures of ventilation. You can see the fume plume um, as the guy's welding, but he's got his uh, ventilation, his smoke sucker right over it, and he's sucking all the welding smoke and welding fumes out of his work area. He does not have his head directly over the, the workpiece or the weld, and he's not just inhaling this stuff like there's no tomorrow. So um, these are things to keep in mind. And uh, For those of you who haven't uh, dealt with hot work permits, this is kind of a... The slide's just going to touch on and kind of explain what it is. Hot work permit is a document issued for the purpose of authorizing a specified welding or cutting activity. A hot work permit is needed on some job sites in order to perform work that involves a source of ignition when flammable materials are in the vicinity or can be considered a fire hazard. Welding, soldering, cutting, and brazing are all considered hot work, as is grinding and drilling in the presence of flammable materials. A hot work permit system helps an organization maintain control of hot work operations to avoid injuries and losses from fires. Due to the hazardous nature of all types of hot work operations, millions of dollars in damage are caused each year around the country. 
A hot work permit system provides the following advantages. Workers are reminded of required safety precautions and responsibilities, central organizational control and coordination of hot work activities within a given location. Um, like I said, I, I don't think I mentioned this before, but um, when I was in the Navy, I was on a ship, obviously, Navy ship kind of goes together. We went through a shipyard period and generally just any time there was welding being done on the ship, they had a hot work permit that was needed. Joe Welder, you know, a hull technician, couldn't just strike up an arc and start welding somewhere. He had to go get permission from the powers that be that said, hey, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be doing this welding work. Do you want me to do it or do we want to do it later? How do we want to approach this? So there was a there was a system and it gave you control over who was doing welding, what, when, where and how. And that's what a hot per, hot work permit does. It just kind of keeps all the cats going in the right direction. And if you get into a certain situation where welding absolutely has to be done in a place that maybe isn't the best place for welding, you can take all the precautions. The workers can be reminded of the safety precautions and their responsibilities. Um, central control can let people know that, hey, we got hot work going on in this place and it's kind of a it's not the best place to be welding, but we absolutely have to have welding done here. So that's what a hot work permit is and why we have a hot work permit system. What is hot work and why is it hazardous? OSHA defines hot work as work involving electric continuation of the previous slide um, why should we be concerned about hot work well because sometimes when welding or cutting a spark invites disaster because of the tremendous potential of flammable vapors or gases that might be present Sparks and slag can scatter throughout an area where hot work is going on, sometimes up to 35 feet or more. Sparks and slag can also pass through cracks, gratings, doors, drains, other open hatches, openings in walls, floors, vessels, and creating fire explosion hazards, sometimes in distant areas. So we need to be cognizant of what we're doing, what we're working on, and the areas around us that might have a potential for um, combustible to catch on fire. This is an example of a hot work permit. I got this off of the University of Tennessee Knoxville's website. Um, you can see the required precautions. You can see, you know, the names, the nature of the job, the hot work operator. And, you know, you just go through this checklist. You're not welding on ceilings or walls and there's monitors and confined, confined space entry forms and adequate ventilation for smoke and vapors, all these kinds of things. Um, but, you know, and this isn't the only way to do it. This is just one I found on the internet and was able to give you guys an example of what a hot work permit looks like. You know, permit request time, date, expires, just general information. Hot work permit program, hot work locations. Hot work is generally allowed in two types of locations. Designated area, which is a permanent location approved for routine hot work operations made safe by removal of all possible sources of ignition that could be ignited by the hot work tool, welding, cutting, brazing. Controlled area is one in which safe conditions for hot work exist or where safe conditions can be created by moving or protecting combustibles. Non-permissible locations. Hot work is never permitted in certain types of locations where safe conditions do not exist and cannot be created. So these are some general, and not to say these um, definitions do apply, apply to every hot work um, permit program, but it's plus or minus. It's generally the definitions that are probably going to be used or something close to it. But it gives you an idea that, hey, there's some places where we do welding all the time. We've moved all the flammables. We're good to go in this area. Controlled area. 
that's when you do have to go do something specific out on a site and we're going to do a one time right here um, we're going to create safe work conditions in this spot for this point in time and then after that we're not going to weld here anymore we've had our permit it says we can weld from this point to this point in time until this task is done and then we're out of here and then non-permissible locations are just heck no we're not ever welding here so there's no way we can create a positive work environment um, safe working conditions for welding so we're just not ever going to do it here in this place here's a, an example of a hot work um, designated area you can see the welders they've got everything cleaned up they don't have stacks of wood and rags and combustible materials this is a hot work designated area light it up go for it weld all you need to in this area you don't need to get people's permission we don't have anything here that's going to catch on fire and we've taken the requisite uh, precautions to make sure that nothing's going to catch on fire and there's nothing in this area that's going to get caught on fire welding of containers any container of a hollow body such as a can tank hollow compartment in a welding or a hollow area on a casting should be given special attention prior to welding even though it may contain only air heat from welding the metal can raise the temperature of the enclosed air or gas to a dangerously high pressure causing the container to explode hollow areas can contain oxygen enriched air or fuel gases which can be hazardous when heated or exposed to an arc or flame cleaning the container is necessary in all cases before cutting and welding and even this sometimes isn't exactly the only answer um, we there's all kinds of horror stories about people that um, were welding on you know gas tanks that they emptied out and then they hook up a vacuum cleaner to suck out the fumes and just these terrible stories of things gone wrong um, you need to be really really careful around the welding of containers and empty barrels and things like this um, a lot of recommendations include um, filling it up with water or purging it with another type of um, non-combustible gas um, you really need to look into the welding of containers before you do it and um, see what the OSHA um, rules are but you really need to be careful if you see somebody welding on a container you probably should mention it to them and ensure that they're doing it safely work on drums and tanks severe explosions and fires many resulting in fatalities have been caused by welding cutting and brazing soldering on pipes tanks drums and similar vessels which previously contained flammable materials Containers which have held petrol, white spirit, or other flammable substances are highly dangerous to work on, and a pinpoint of heat can be enough to set off an explosion or fire. Equally dangerous are pipes or containers which have held substances like linseed oil, soap, diesel oil, acids that react with metals to produce hydrogen or combustible solids which may have left a residue of dust. It is essential to remove all residues. The preferred method is to steam clean and then either fill with an inert gas such as carbon dioxide or nitrogen or fill with water, leaving a very small vented space at the point where the repair is to be made. Allow for the expansion of liquid in small bore pipes. Washing containers with cold or hot water or blowing with air are both ineffective. So this is telling us don't weld on gas tanks barrels any of that kind of stuff and if you're going to you need to steam clean them and then you got to fill them with either an inert gas or you just fill the thing with water so that the only part of the tank that's got any air on it is the area which you're going to be welding on so this greatly reduces your chances of blowing something up catching on fire or getting yourself killed so when we're talking about um, working on drums and tanks, you're going to fill with water, leave a very small vented space at the point where the repair is to be made. 
So, um, you know, this is just a general idea. This is not to scale and whatever. But it does show you, okay, we fill the tank, we steam clean the tank, we fill it with water, and then we're going to weld on that little area that's vented, and we've got um, just a little bit of air. So if there is anything explosive in there, it's just going to have a very small area, and the water is covering up anything else that could be an issue. That um, area is taken up by water, obviously, not an explosive gas or fumes. So that's the theory behind um, using this method. Um, also, they said to use, you know, uh, something like nitrogen, I think, or carbon dioxide. You use a, you use a gas uh, that's not air. Fill it up and go from there. So, oxygen is our friend. Oxygen is what we breathe. Without oxygen, we're in trouble. But compressed oxygen and pure oxygen, you know, air is, what, 78% um, nitrogen. Most of the air we breathe is nitrogen. And there's a 20% plus or minus component of oxygen in the air that we breathe. So we're not breathing pure oxygen. Pure oxygen will catch stuff on fire in a big way. Um, you put oxygen with just about anything, and then it's an explosion. So... Do not permit oil or grease to come in contact with compressed oxygen gases. Explosion may occur. Um, separate oxygen cylinders from those containing flammable gases by a minimum distance of 20 feet or by a non-combustible partition extending not less than 18 inches above and to the sides of the stored material. Never store oxygen cylinders near flammable solvents, combustible materials, unproductive electrical connections, or, or ignition or heat sources. Yeah, bad things will happen if you expose it to pure oxygen. Shoe polish, uh, shoe polish like in the military. Certain people don't have to polish their shoes in the military because they're dealing with pure oxygen and their boots will catch on fire. So they are prohibited from using uh, shoe polish on their boots. So oxygen, you need to just be careful with it, it's, especially when there's combustibles around because it's just going to be a bad thing. Explosions. Oxygen hazards. Oxygen is slightly heavier than air, vapor-specific gravity 1.10. Pure oxygen can be very reactive. Systems must be properly designed, cleaned, and maintained and operated. Use no oil, oxygen cleaned stickers should be applied to things. Explosions or fires can be initiated by the sudden pressure increase when a cylinder valve is opened if the system is not cleaned or properly maintained. Mixed with a flammable gas, hydrogen, propane, acetylene, this will become explosive and in welding operations this can happen if there is no backflow prevented. Electric shock is a peril associated with electric resistance and electric arc welding. A shock can happen because the equipment isn't properly grounded. Direct contact with energized leads or from contact with the welding leads via moist gloves or clothing or damp floors or humid air. Even though welding generally uses low voltage, there is still a danger of electric shock. The environmental conditions of the welder, such as wet or cramped spaces, may make the likelihood of shock greater. Falls and other accidents can result from even a small shock. Brain damage and death can result from a large shock. Pretty, pretty good reasons to uh, be cognizant of electric shock and to understand that there are precautions that you want to take to keep this from um, happening to anybody. Electric shock. You're, the arc welding, uh, you're dealing with electricity. Um, you need to be cognizant of electric shock. The insulation on welding and current leads is undamaged and the conductor is thick enough to carry the current safely. You need to have this. You don't want a bunch of ratty cables. All connectors are clean, undamaged, and correctly rated for the current required. Don't use welding equipment with damage and insulation on the welding cables, plugs, clamps, torch, electrode holder. Use the appropriate personnel protective equipment for the task. Properly place and protect the welding cables carefully to avoid any accidental damage to the cable insulation layer and exposure of the inner copper conductor. 
Use proper cable connectors to extend the welding cables. This is all pretty much common sense. Um, clean, undamaged, and correctly rated for the current required. Don't use welding equipment with damaged insulation on the welding cables. You know, um, all this stuff is pretty much common sense, but you'll see, you'll run into a lot of times when human beings aren't about common sense and they'll take shortcuts to get the job done. Well, I'll just do it this one time. Well, sometimes that can lead to catastrophic events. Electric shock is a peril associated with electric resistance and electric arc welding. A shock can happen because the equipment isn't properly grounded. Direct contact with energized leads or from contact with the welding leads via moist gloves or clothing or damp floors or humid air. Even though welding generally uses low voltage, there is still a danger of electric shock. The environmental conditions of the welder, such as wet or cramped spaces, may make the likelihood of shock greater. Falls and other accidents can result from even a small shock. Brain damage and death can result from a large shock. Pretty, pretty good reasons to uh, be cognizant of electric shock and to understand that there are precautions that you want to take to keep this from um, happening to anybody. Some acronyms, terms, definitions. ANSI, American National Standards Institute, an organization promoting technical and safety standards. ANSI Z49.1 Safety in Welding, Cutting, and Allied Processes, a document outlining safe practices for welding and cutting operations. ANSI Z87.1 Practice for Occupational edu Educational Eye and Face Protection. AWS, the American Welding Society. AWS is the technical leader in welding and related issues. Combustibles, any material that can easily catch fire. Cryogenic, very cold service, usually well below zero degrees F. Electric shock can kill a worker regardless of voltage level. A shock severity is measured by the amount of current flowing through the body, the length of time the body is in contact with the current, and the path the current takes through the body. Avoid electric shock by following safe work practices for electric power tools, appliances, light fixtures, and machinery. Tools and equipment. Use tools and equipment according to the manufacturer's instructions. Inspect equipment and tools before using them. Remove defective tools from service such as those with frayed cords, missing prongs, or cracked casings. Do not repair tools yourself. Attach do not use tags to defective tools and let others know not to use them. Place them in an area set aside for broken equipment and report defects to a supervisor. Never use electric appliances or tools near water. Use double insulated tools, those with non-metallic cases. But remember, you can still be shocked if water enters the tool's housing. If a double insulated tool is dropped into water, disconnect the power source before you reach for it. Clean and inspect tools when you are done with them. This includes your cords too. Make sure the cords are up to snuff, that they're not torn or ripped or there's anything showing metallic a conductor so something that could come back to get you electric shock your the arc welding 
uh, you're dealing with electricity. Um, you need to be cognizant of electric shock. The insulation on welding and current leads is undamaged and the conductor is thick enough to carry the current safely. You need to have this. You don't want a bunch of ratty cables. All connectors are clean, undamaged, and correctly rated for the current required. Don't use welding equipment with damage and insulation on the welding cables, plugs, clamps, torch, electrode holder. Use the appropriate personnel protective equipment for the task. Properly place and protect the welding cables carefully to avoid any accidental damage to the cable insulation layer and exposure of the inner copper conductor. Use proper cable connectors to extend the welding cables. This is all pretty much common sense. Um, clean, undamaged, and correctly rated for the current required. Don't use welding equipment with damaged insulation on the welding cables. You know, um, all this stuff is pretty much common sense, but you'll see, you'll run into a lot of times when human beings aren't about common sense and they'll take shortcuts to get the job done. Well, I'll just do it this one time. Well, sometimes that can lead to catastrophic events. Okay, I know it gets tedious. I include one of these in about every other um, presentation I do, but I guess I just want to spread the wealth. Um, acknowledgements, I poach a lot of this material from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission Introduction to Welding Technology and Code Courses, ML12157A587. It's a good starting point. Can teach um, the Canadian deuterium uranium people. Um, HTPS, I'm not going to read that web page. You guys can figure it out, the can-do stuff. The U.S. Army's also got a pretty good, um, it's old, but it covers a lot of material. Um, TM 9-237, Welding Theory and Application, is a good uh, place to find some high-quality welding information. None of it's changed over the last 50 years. But anyways, that's why I always include this, is because there might be somebody out there that's looking for some free material doesn't want to pay for a book and you want some good high quality welding material, this is it. Questions, comments, or whatever. Um, my name is Gary Pace. I'm a professional engineer, welding engineer, certified weld inspector. I'm out of Katy, Texas. There's my email address and my website. Feel free to drop me a line if you have questions or whatever. I want to chat about welding related or materials or Maybe you've got an idea on something I need to cover in a future episode. All right, take care. GP out.